All right, so let's talk about MSK, the lower extremity. Um, and thank you so much, as always, for the really nice comments. I just always really do appreciate that. So thank you so much. Um, so for MSK, I just wanted to give a little heads up before we get started. So there's with MSK, especially the lower extremities, there's just so many different conditions or so many injuries, diseases, so many different details. I'm not going to go over everything. There may be some things that I skip, but if I skip something, it's because I don't think it's very high yield. I think it's very unlikely it'll come up on an exam. I'm going to stick to the unique things, the things that often came up on exam questions, the things that I got tested on, things that you need to focus on. So this is going to be a triple distilled version of the lower extremity. Again, I'll go over the stuff I feel like you really need to know. And I'm going to be kind of light on both treatment and diagnosis because a lot of it's redundant, especially with diagnosis. It's just x-ray. Then you go to advanced imaging, MRI. If there's something unique about diagnosis, I'll talk about it. Definitely the diagnostic work of the special maneuvers like Lachman test, McMurray sign. I'll definitely focus on those because that's what you'll be tested on. And then treatment, there's not a lot to know. It's not very high yield. It's basically supportive all the way to surgery. Again, if there's something unique, I'll go over it. If there's not, if you don't need to know it, I'm not going to mention it. Um, and sorry in advance for the mnemonic overload. This is how I got through this in school. I just developed so many mnemonics because there's so much stuff to know for MSK. So hopefully some of them will help you. If not, again, I'm sorry. There's a lot of them. So let's go ahead and get started. We'll start with the hip and then we'll work our way on down. So let's start with the hip fracture. So mechanism of injury. If they're young, you're looking for major trauma. So motor, motor vehicle collision. Um, hip fracture is not something that's going to be common in young patients unless there's a serious trauma or if there's some sort of pathologic condition that led to the fracture. Otherwise, um, old patients is normally who you're looking for here. Osteoporosis and falls. Approximately 90% of hip fractures in older patients are going to occur from just a simple fall from a standing position. Um, so again, in young patients, think high impact injury like an MVA. Older adults, think low impact like a fall from a standing position due to some bone loss seen in this age, particularly in women due to the higher rates of osteoporosis. Um, now let's talk about the different types of hip fractures. Um, depending on the location involved, you have the femoral neck, intertrochanteric fractures, trochanteric fractures. The only one I think you should commit to memory though is the femoral neck fractures because of the risk associated with this type. So with femoral neck fractures, you should be thinking avascular necrosis. You need to know this type is associated with one of the highest risks of avascular necrosis. The blood supply to the femoral neck, it's relatively poor, similar to the scaphoid bone, which we'll go over at some point on the upper extremities. Um, so any trauma to this area, like a fracture, can lead to the disruption of the already tenuous blood supply and can lead to complications like avascular necrosis, which is going to be death of the tissue, the bone, due to insufficient blood supply. So remember, increased risk of avascular necrosis with femoral neck fractures compared to other type of hip fractures. That's the one you should focus on when you're learning about the different types. Now on physical exam, shortened externally rotated lower extremity. So with most displaced hip fractures, most of them are going to present with the leg being externally rotated and shortened. And this is important because with a hip dislocation, it's usually the opposite. So with most hip dislocations, you'll see internal rotation and external rotation with the fracture. So internal rotation with the dislocation most of the time. And the way that you can remember this is going to be this. So hip dislocation versus fracture. So in a fracture, again, most of the time you're going to see external rotation. Again, it's not 100%, nothing's 100% medicine, but most of the time with a fracture, externally rotated. Fracture has an E, but it does not have an I. So the E, remember, externally rotated. Hip dislocation usually is going to be internally rotated. Dislocation has an I, but it does not have an E. So that helps you remember when you see a fracture, only has an E, think externally rotated. When you see a dislocation, think internally rotated. So that's how you remember the presentation on the physical exam for a hip fracture. Treatment, um, is surgical in most cases ORIF, which stands for open reduction with internal fixation, um, versus another option, which would be um, arthroplasty. Again, don't focus too much on treatment. This will likely not be what you're going to be tested on. Um, so, yeah, again, that's just surgical. And let's talk about hip dislocation. So really just a few things to know for hip dislocations. Mechanism of injury, you're thinking large force trauma as your most common cause. So motor vehicle accidents, pedestrians struck by automobiles, those are the most common causes of hip dislocations. They're also associated with high energy impact sports. Think football, rugby, skiing, snowboarding, gymnastics, but focus on large force trauma, MVA, etc. This you definitely need to know. Posterior dislocation, most common, 80 to 
So you can have a posterior or an anterior hip dislocation, but post posterior is way more common, and that's what you need to memorize. Up to 90% of the cases will be posterior, aka that's what you're going to be tested on. That's what you need to know. That's what you need to focus on. Physical exam, like we talked about before, shortened internally rotated lower extremity. So majority of the time, patients will present with a shortened internally rotated lower extremity, and that's because this is the classic presentation of a posterior dislocation which we know is by far the most common type, about 90% of the time. This will be the presentation, shortened, internally rotated. Um, anterior dislocation will generally be externally rotated, but who cares? Do not memorize that. If you see a hip dislocation, be thinking internal rotation. And again, the way you remember that, fracture, externally rotated, because it has an E, not an I. Dislocation has an I, not an E, so internally rotated. So don't forget that. Um, treatment, again, not very high yield, but pretty straightforward here. Reduce the dislocation. This can be done either um, with closed under sedation or open with surgical reduction. And this is something that needs to be done urgently because the longer the dislocation proceeds without intervention, the higher the risk of complications like avascular necrosis. All right, moving on. Let's talk about slipped capital femoral epiphysis. It's a very long name. It's a weakness in the proximal femoral growth plate that leads to displacement of the capital femoral epiphysis. So to put this really simply, the femoral head is slipping off the femoral neck. Sometimes it's described as ice cream falling off a cone because that's what it looks like on x-ray. Risk factor is the one you really need to know, obesity. This is the single greatest risk factor. More than 60% of patients with this condition measured greater than or equal to the 90th percentile in weight. So obesity is big with slip, uh, slipped cap. Um, males, more prevalent in males, approximately a 1.5 to 1 um, male to female ratio. And then the age range you should be looking for, 12 years in girls and 13.5 years in boys. That would be the peak age, so mean age of presentation, 12 in girls, 13.5 in boys. And that's because that's when they're experiencing a peak in their growth related to puberty. Um, <clears throat> so these risk factors give you a pretty good idea of what type of patient you're looking for in the vignette. They're always going to give you the most patient, the most common patient demographic. So you're not looking for a seven-year-old skinny female with slip cap. The patient in the vignette is going to be uh, a male. It's going to be obese, and they're going to be in the age range from 12 to 13 years. Remember these little details. It really helps picking these out in vignettes. Clinical manifestations, painful limp. So the two most common manifestations to see in patients are pain and altered gait. So uh, painful limp. Um, the classic complaint will be a child complaining of dull, aching pain in the hip, the groin, even the knee with no preceding trauma. So be careful with that because around 15% of patients, the only complaint they may have is isolated thigh or knee pain, not necessarily the hip. And that's actually because of the involvement of the medial obturator nerve, which runs along the medial thigh from the knee up through the hip. You don't need to know that, but it's just sometimes a little bit of extra knowledge isn't a bad thing. Um, as far as the diagnosis, I am going to mention this because this has that classic presentation on x-ray um, of the ice cream slipping off of a cone. So the diagnosis of slip cap is usually made with just plain radiographs and the classic appearance will reveal a posterior displacement of the femoral epiphysis. They give you a picture on the x-ray. It's going to look like, as you can see here, ice cream slipping off a cone. Remember, that's the classic way to descri describe this on x-ray ice cream slipping off a cone, the femoral head sliding off of the neck, as you can see here, and you can kind of get an idea uh, in these three pictures here, what that kind of looks like. Treatment. So this is another thing, again, I'm going to focus, I'll tell you about treatment and diagnosis if it's unique or important. And in this case, it is because um, these patients need um, to be non-weight bearing right away and then refer to an orthopedic surgeon. And the, the treatment is usually going to be surgical pinning. That's the gold standard for slipped cap. Um, a single cannulated screw placed in the center of the epiphysis to keep the ice cream from falling off of the cone. So most of these patients are going to require surgery for this, which is important because we're going to go over some similar conditions where that's not the case. So let's actually talk about one next, which is leg calve perth, I think it's perthes disease. So this is um, idiopathic osteonecrosis, which is avascular necrosis of the hip. So the blood supply to the head of the femur gets disrupted and this can lead to death or necrosis of the tissue. There's some theories and proposed mechanisms, but normally we don't know why this happens. So the age range you're looking for, five to eight years old, it can be seen in children anywhere from the age of three to 12, but the peak incidence is between five to eight. So that's who you should be looking for. This is very common in males. It's a one to four male to female ratio. So definitely will be a male in the vignette. They give you a female, probably not going to be Lake Calvé. 
probably something else. Now, clinical manifestations. I say painless limp and I put an asterisk there. So let's talk about this. So they absolutely may have pain with this condition. I'm just generalizing this for the sake of the exam. I'm saying painless limp. It's not clear cut in real life. Don't put in the comments. Doesn't always, don't say it's not, it's not always painless. I know, I know. Um, but for the exam, this is how I want you to remember this. So normally this disease has an insidious onset. It can start with little to no pain. Um, oftentimes just hip stiffness, loss of internal rotation. Eventually it does progress and they will develop some discomfort usually after activity. Um, and the pain, if it is present, is normally mild and often referred to the thigh or the knee. Most exam questions, though, are going to present this to you as a painless limp or maybe a limp with just mild pain, which helps differentiate from slipped cap, which normally has a painful limp. Again, this is not 100%. Lake calve can be painful. Slipped cap can be painless. But for the sake of the exam, it's better just to remember leg calve as painless and slip cap as painful. And if you ever forget which one has a painful limp, which one has a painless limp, this is kind of like a way that I used to remember it. So leg, so you think of painless and you think of painful. Painless with an L, painful with an F. Leg calve prothes disease does not have an F anywhere in it, but it does have an L. So that helps you remember painless limp. Slip cap femoral epiphysis has an F, which is in painful, but it doesn't have an L anywhere in the first letters of the words. So that helps you remember this is a painful condition. So if you ever look at the exam question and it says painless, and you're like, I can't remember which one is painless, remember, does it have an L anywhere for painless? If it does, like in the first letter of Le Calve, then you know that would be Le Calve that has painless. And if it has an F, you know, slip cap femoral epiphysis, painful. So that's how I remembered that. It's a little confusing when I say it out loud, but it helps me. <laughs> Hopefully it helps you too. All right. So treatment, this is important because it's different than slipped cap. Again, they're going to give you these on an exam and they're going to have both. And you need to be able to differentiate. So with Le Calve, treatment is generally observation. So most cases, the treatment for Le Calve is observation with non-weight bearing physical therapy, around 60 to 70% of hips affected heal spontaneously without any functional impairment. So while surgery is an option, it's not as common and it's mostly reserved for older children, generally over eight, whereas younger patients typically don't benefit from surgery. So leg cave and slip cap have a lot of similar sim similarities and sometimes it's hard to differentiate between the two on the exam question. And you'll get a question about one of these on the exam. So let's go over the key differences. So I made a little chart here. Again, nothing is 100% here. These can obviously be different depending, but generally they're going to give you the most common presentation and that's what this would be. So for slip cap, 12 to 13 is the peak age you're looking for. Lake calve, you're looking for a younger patient, 5 to 8. Slip cap, you're going to have the painful limp, Lake calve, painless. Again, not 100%, but it's good to know that for the exam because that's normally how they present it. And then slip cap, you're generally going to have to have surgery. Lake calve, it's more commonly going to be observation. So that's just a little combination or a little comparison of the two. Let's move on to another similar um, condition in children, which is osgood Schlatter disease. So this is an injury caused by repetitive strain and chronic avulsion of the apophysis of the tibial tubercle. So in younger children, the tibial tuberosity, I just want to explain this a little bit. So in younger children, the tibial tuberosity where the patellar tendon attaches to, it hasn't ossified yet, which basically just means it hasn't completely turned to bone yet. It still contains some cartilage, so it's weaker. So in kids who are active, who play a lot of sports and are jumping and kicking and squatting a lot, that patellar ligament is constantly pulling on that attachment side of the tibial tubercle, uh, tubercle. And eventually this causes separation of the patellar tendon from the tibial tubercle and some causes some trauma and inflammation. Eventually, as the area begins to heal, a callus is formed, which leads to the, um, the tibial tubercle, tibial tubercle um, becoming more pronounced, which is generally what we see on x-ray or when we palpate on physical exam, the elevation of the tibial tuberosity. So just kind of be familiar with the patho behind it. So you're looking for a 13 to 14 year old boy during a growth spurt. Um, it can be seen in ages ranging from 9 to 14, but it's more common in boys in the 13 to 14 year old range as this is a common time for a growth spurt. It can also occur in girls, but it's not as common in the vignette. Be looking for a boy in their early teens. Um, now on exam, on clinical manifestation, I'm sorry, they'll be looking for, uh, you'll be looking for anterior knee pain, which is exacerbated by activity. So kneeling, running, jumping, squatting. Think basketball as the vignettes almost always give you a young male playing basketball that presents with anterior knee pain. 
And then on physical exam, you're looking for a pronounced tender tibial tubercle. So remember, all that callus formation is causing this area to become more pronounced. As far as treatment, conservative treatment, so osgood schlatter is typically a benign and self-limited condition, and conservative measures are the mainstay of therapy. So NSAIDs, physical therapy, etc., self-limited condition, and symptoms generally resolve once the growth, the growth plate is ossified. It's rare to require surgery. <clears throat> so few different pediatric conditions, they can all get so confusing. So I just, I had a little way that I remembered kind of the idea about um, the things that are involved in this disease, because you're going to get a question and you're going to have all the answer choices and you're going to have osgood schlatter you're going to have late calve slip cap, you're not going to remember which is which. So what I used to remember for osgood schlatter disease, instead of osgood schlatter disease, I remembered osgood squatter disease, osgood squatter disease instead of osgood schlatter disease, and that just helped me remember Normally the presentation, they're going to say they were squatting or bending down or playing some sports where they were kind of like kneeling down. So that's where you get the squatter from. And then Denise just helps you remember it involves the knees because, you know, the other ones like Calvay and all those are more hip related. So this just kind of helps you remember this is about the knees, the tibial tubercle, patellar um, ligament, and then helps you remember squatter because that's normally when they're going to present with their pain, when they're squatting, kneeling down, etc. So that's osgood schlatter disease. Let's keep moving along. Your ACL injury. So the ACL is the most commonly injured knee lig ligament. And the majority of ACL tears occur from athletic injuries. So this is normally going to be from a non-contact pivoting in injury. That's the most common cause. Um, so the typical mechanism for an ACL injury involves a running or jumping athlete who suddenly stops and changes direction. Like they're cutting, um, they pivot, or they land in a way that involves rotation and valgus stress of the knee and the tibia slides anteriorly on the femur, and then pop goes the ACL. So history, you're looking for a pop and swell. So the way this will be described in a vignette, or of course in real life, is the patient felt a pop in their knee at the time of injury and then had acute swelling after. So that swelling is really important because hemarthrosis is going to be what leads to the swelling. And up to 77% of patients presenting with acute traumatic knee hemarthrosis have an ACL injury. So that's really common. You need to remember that swelling. So remember pop and then a sudden swelling, pop and swell for the ACL. You can remember that little rhyme there. Um, physical exam. Lachman test, you have to know this. Lachman test is the most sensitive exam test for the ACL. Therefore, this is the one you should absolutely commit to memory. Do this test with the knee and 30 degrees of flexion. I can you take a look at what that is here. And then stabilize the distal femur with one hand while pulling the prox proximal tibia um, anteriorly towards you with the other hand. An intact ACL is going to limit the anterior translation, which is like how far the tibia will go, um, how far forward it will go. And if this isn't the case, there's increased translation, anterior translation compared to the unaffected knee. This patient likely has an ACL tear. And you take a look at this, and this is how you remember that Lachman is the most sensitive test for the ACL tear. Lachman, the first three letters here, is actually ACL. So the first three letters of Lachman, ACL, is ACL rearranged. So as soon as you see Lachman on the answer choices, and it says something about ACL, you can remember ACL is in the name Lachman, which is so nice and convenient, and that'll help you remember that on the exam. So remember, Lachman is the most sensitive test for the ACL, te the ACL tear, and ACL is in the name Lachman, the first three letters. Okay, treatment. So treatment's going to be um, individualized to each each patient. Um, most active younger patients and athletes will opt for surgical re um, reconstruction. Older patients may go the conservative route with physical therapy, et cetera. So conservative for surgical repair. So two things I memorized for ACL tear, ACL tear, the pop and swell for the ACL, the pop felt in the knee, followed by the hemarthrosis causing the swelling. And then remember Lachman test, best physical exam test, Lachman ACL rearranged the first three letters. Let's go and onto our posterior cruciate ligament injury. Very little to know here. It's not very high yield. Um, it's rare to see this as an isolated injury. Isolated PCL injuries are really uncommon. It's usually going to be in combination with other multi-ligament trauma to the knee. So the, the mechanism they should be looking for is a direct blow to the proximal tibia with a flexed knee, which is like a classic dashboard injury. So main cause of PCL injury is a high energy trauma, most often involving, most often involving motor vehicle collisions. Um, second most common cause would be sporting related activities, but focus on the, the MVA, the direct blow to the proximal tibia with a flex knee when it hits the dashboard. The physical exam test you should know is the posterior drawer test. 
So there's a few different physical exam maneuvers for a PCL tear, but the posterior drawer test is generally considered the most accurate maneuver for di diagnosing PCL injury. And that's the one you should know. So knee at 90 degrees of flexion, wrap both hands around the, the patient's proximal tibia, um, normally sitting on the foot to keep the leg fixated, and then apply a posteriorly directed force to the proximal tibia. So you push back on the tibia with a, with a knee flexed, Increased posterior tibial dis displacement compared to the uninvolved leg suggests a tear of the uh, PCL. Of course, you're going to do your MRI to confirm. Um, and then as far as treatment, conservative, again, versus surgical. Um, nothing really specific to know here. One thing, it's, it's really surprising that um, some individuals with this type of injury, especially like well-trained athletes, um, can actually be completely fine with this with no treatment at all. So they found 2% of all college football players that were presenting for the NFL draft um, when they had their physical exam done prior to the NFL draft, 2% of the players actually had an asymptomatic PCL tear. So they were playing football with this tear and didn't even know it. So a lot of times people can be fine without surgery or treatment. Um, obviously, if you're you know playing sports, so you probably should have it or you're young, you should have it repaired. So PCL ligament injury, not much to know there. Let's move on to our medial collateral ligament injury. Um, so this is caused by valgus force to the lateral aspect of the knee. So there's really two mechanisms of injury we'll see with an MCL injury, either from direct valgus stress from a blow to the lateral aspect of the knee or via indirect stress, like the foot gets caught on the floor while the athlete is trying to change direction quickly. The key is that valgus stress, whatever the cause, Something caused the knee to be pushed inward, valgus stress, that's what you need to remember. And then your physical exam test is going to be a positive valgus stress test. So the diagnosis of um, an MCL injury is often made clinically based just on the history, the clinical presentation, and then the ex exam findings on the valgus stress test. And the physical exam you need to know is this valgus stress test. So you do this with a, um, with a knee at both 30 degrees of flexion and zero degrees of extension, and you apply valgus stress and look for um, laxity of the joint and pain, and you feel how much the, the medial joint line widens. So you need to remember your positive valgus stress test is associated with a MCL injury. The way that I used to remember the MCL versus the LCL tears and the, um, the test and the type of stress that was um, associated with both so this is how I remembered it. Hopefully this makes sense to you. If not, I apologize, but I'm going to waste your time here with this. So MCL tear, valgus stress, LCL tear, varus stress. So I used to remember um, valgus, valgus stress. They used to help me remember, um, or valgus stress. It used to help me remember mucho gusto. So in valgus, gusto, and then mucho gusto. So valgus stress, mucho gusto, because gus and gusto, the mucho helped me remember the M, in MCL. I apologize for my terrible accent on this, but, um, and then mucho gusto stands for nice to meet you in English. And that's because the knees are being flexed and bent inward and they're like meeting in the middle, or it even looks like they're saying like, nice to meet you. They're like meeting in the middle. So MCL tear, valgus stress, gusto, the M stands for mucho, mucho gusto, MCL, valgus stress, nice to meet you because they're meeting in the middle. And then LCL tear is varus stress. And then I used to remember rust as in rust, and then L as in leaky. So leaky pipes rust helped me remember varus stress is um, LCL tear. So that's how I remember the two. I don't know how much sense that actually makes when I say it out loud, but I, I never forgot that for many years. So let's talk about lateral collateral ligament injury. Next, LCL injury. So this occurs due to a sudden varus force to the knee. These are among the least common knee injuries, um, but they can occur when the knee joint is struck from the inside, so varus stress. And it's really rare to have this as an isolated injury. It's more common to be in combination with other um, other injuries as well. So just like we just went over, the physical exam test is going to be a positive varus stress test. So again, you do this at both 30 degrees of flexion and zero degrees of full extension while applying varus stress. And then we know the way we remember valgus first varus, varus, rust, leaky pipes, rust, LCL tear, MCL tear, valgus stress, mucho gusto, knees are meeting together. And then by method of exclusion, you remember if mucho gusto means nice to meet you and the knees are meeting together, varus is the opposite. And you remember leaky pipes, rust, varus stress. Okay, so let's keep moving on. There's not much to know for those. So just a couple of things. Let's talk about meniscal injury. So acute meniscal tears, um, often occur from twisting injuries. So they normally happen when a person quickly changes direction while rotating or twisting the knee when the foot is planted. Um, an older 
older adults, we um, see chronic degenerative tears, and these can occur with minimal twisting or stress, and in some cases, no trauma at all. But in general, be thinking of some sort of twisting of the leg in the vignette. Now, clinical manifestations, I want you to remember pop, lock, and drop. So pop, lock, and drop it. Um, so when you think of meniscal tears, pop, lock, and drop is the most common clinical manifestations. So patients with untreated meniscal tears are going to complain of the knee popping, locking where they can't fully extend the knee, and then sometimes the knee just giving out where they drop because the knee just gave way. So remember, meniscal, meniscal tears, pop, lock, and drop it. And then physical exam. Joint line tenderness is actually the most sensitive physical exam finding, but it's nonspecific because it can be caused by so many other things. So the physical exam test you need to know about, it's the most commonly tested on, is going to be the McMurray's test. So the McMurray test is a test of repeated passive flexion and extension of the knee. You place your fingers on the joint line while you're performing the test and you're feeling for a painful pop or click in the knee, likely indicating a, um, a meniscal tear. So you're moving the knee, flex, flexing, extending, and then feeling for that in the in the joint line there. So there's some other tests, the Apley, the Thessaly, they're not as commonly used or tested on. Focus on the McMurray's test. That's the one you'll likely need to do in an OSCE. It's likely the one you'll get tested on. And then this is how you can remember the McMurray's test is associated with meniscal tears. So I used to remember meniscal tear, McMurray test, um, meniscal in that word is men is call, men is called Murray because Murray is a man's name. So as soon as you see men is called, what, what are men called? Men is called Murray. So that's just always helping me remember it. As soon as you see men is called, men is called Murray. Murray's a man's name. That's what men are called. Men is called Murray. Murray. <laughs> okay. So moving on to our knee dislocations, our tibiofemoral dislocations. There's not a lot to know here. Um, so this is a potentially limb-threatening injury. So dislocations of the tibiofemoral joint of the knee, they're true surgical emergencies. They have a high rate of neurovascular injury. And if there's a popliteal artery injury caused from the dislocation, which goes unrecognized, after about eight hours, the majority of patients are going to um, lose the leg. They're going to require amputation of the leg. So it's a really serious injury. Um, it normally happens from high energy trauma. It's a relatively rare injury, but when it does play, take place, it's generally going to be something high energy, like again, another motor, motor vehicle accident falls from really high elevation. And then the complications are basically the things that you need to know here. These are the most important things to remember about the tibiofemoral dislocations. So a popliteal artery, this is the most dangerous complication following a tibiofemoral dislocation. And the delay in diagnosis and repair can lead to amputation. So we need to avoid missing this in diagnosis. And after the dislocation is reduced, we assess the distal and popliteal pulses. This can be done with ankle brachial index, a bedside ultrasound if it's available. And if there's any signs of vascular compromise, these patients need um, emergency surgery consult to keep them from losing their leg. And you can just kind of see the relationship between the popliteal artery and the knee and kind of get an idea of why when the knee dislocates, um, this can cause stress and possibly even um, a, uh, a rupture of the of the artery here so you can kind of get an idea of where it is in relationship to the knee um, and then the other one that you should be familiar with not as important but you should know this too is the the peroneal nerve so focus on your popliteal artery but be aware that the peroneal nerve is an injury seen in up to 23 percent of patients with knee dislocations as well main takeaway with knee dislocations assess for vascular compromise don't miss a popliteal artery injury Let's move on to our patellofemoral syndrome. So very little to know with these, but I did get some questions on this, and the next one we'll go over next, iliotibial band syndrome, which are very similar. So it's basically just differentiating between the two. So with patellofemoral syndrome, you need to know they're going to have anterior knee pain. So it's an overuse disorder that involves the patellofemoral region. You can take a look at that here, and it'll present as anterior knee pain around or behind the patella. This is important because the next one will have pain in a different area, and that's sometimes the only way to differentiate between the two. Risk factors, runners and women. In the vignette, look for it to be a female runner. That's your demographic. That's who's going to be in the vignette. That's who this is seen most commonly in. Sometimes this is actually called runner's knee. That's how common it is in runners. Um, I used to remember the name instead of being patellofemoral syndrome. Instead of patellofemoral syndrome, I just remembered patellofemale run syndrome. It kind of sounds like femoral. So patellofemoral syndrome, just remember patellofemale run syndrome because it's going to be a female and it's going to be a runner. That's what you need to know for this. And then treatment, not really anything to know here. Conservative. NSAIDs, rest, etc. The takeaways, remember female, runner, anterior knee pain. That's what you need to know for patello female run syndrome.
Next one, this is going to be the one that they're going to give you in the answers, and you need to remember which is which. So iliotibial band syndrome is going to have lateral knee pain. So it's going to sound, this the whole thing is going to sound very similar to patellofemoral syndrome outside of the difference between the um, location of the pain. So this is the second most common cause of knee pain due to overuse after patellofemoral syndrome, and you're going to have lateral knee pain. So overuse, injury of the lateral knee, the pain develops where the um, iliotibial band runs across the lateral femoral epicondyle, which you can see where that area is here. So again, lateral knee pain, very important to remember. Runners, again, is going to be a risk factors. This is also primarily seen in runners. It can also be seen in cyclists, basically any athlete undergoing exercises with repetitive knee flexion and extension. But primarily, again, this is going to be runners. That's what you're looking for in the vignette. Not so much of a predilection, though, for females, as we saw with patellofemoral syndrome, though. And then treatment, conservative. So on NSAIDs, rest, ice, etc. There are some physical exam tests for this, the Noble, the Ober test. Um, I don't feel they're worth the time memorizing their much higher yield things to focus on for MSK. And there's so much that I just wouldn't waste your time with this. So patellofemoral syndrome, iliotibial band syndrome, very similar. Treatment is similar. Usually in the vignette, they're going to be a runner. The main thing to focus on is where the pain, and that's going to, what's going to be the difference between the, the two patellofemoral syndrome, anterior pain, where the patella is located, and that's going to be how you can remember where the pain is. Um, and then iliotibial band syndrome, the pain is going to be lateral. That's the main takeaway between these two. We need to remember which is which, where the pain is going to be. Let's move on to ankle sprains. So ankle sprain, lateral ankle sprains are going to be your most common inversion of the plantar flexed foot. That'll be the most common mechanism of injury in an ankle sprain. Medial ankle sprains are actually really rare. They're not going to give you that on the vignette. So remember the common stuff. That's what you're going to be tested on. It'll be a lateral ankle, spl lateral ankle sprain, which is involved in 70 to 90% of all sport-related ankle sprains. And the ligament that will most commonly be injured in the vignette is going to be your anterior talofibular ligament. So this is the ligament that is injured in the majority of ankle sprains, 73% of ankle sprains. So know this one. There's obviously other ligaments that can be injured, but this is the one that you need to commit to memory. Um, and the way that I used to remember that is the anterior talofibular ligament is also known as the ATF ligament. And in your mind, what you need to remember is ATF ligament stands for always tears first, because this is the most common ligament um, in an ankle injury to be injured. So remember, anterior talofibular fibular ligament, also known as the ATF ligament. ATF, in your mind, stands for always tears first. That's what they're going to give you on the vignette. This is the question I got. This is the question you're going to get. They're going to ask you which ligament likely um, had a tear in this patient. It's going to be the ATF ligament. Um, and then you can take a look at where the ATF ligament here is in the ankle just to get an idea. Now let's talk about the Ottawa ankle rules. Um, so the Ottawa ankle rules are very sensitive for excluding ankle fractures and determining whether or not you need x-rays of the ankle or midfoot, um, 96 to 99% sensitive. Um, they're very much common sense though. Basically it states if you can walk after the injury and you're not tender in your ankle or your midfoot, this is probably a sprain and you probably don't need an x-ray. So again, very common sense, but let's just talk about what these specific guidelines are. So if you are unable to bear weight immediately after the injury and for four steps in the office or the ER, wherever you're being seen, plus you have tenderness at the posterior edge or the tip of the lateral um, or medial malleolus, then you need an ankle x-ray. It's likely not a sprain and more likely a fracture and you need an x-ray. Or if you are unable to bear weight both immediately after the injury and for four steps in the office slash ER, and you have tenderness at the base of the fifth metatarsal or at the navicular, you need a foot x-ray. So nothing um, really difficult to know here. This is basically just indicating whether or not this is likely a sprain um, or whether it's more likely to be a fracture and you need an x-ray and just kind of understanding which x-ray you're going to order depending on where they have pain. Is it going to be a foot or an ankle x-ray? Um, nothing to know for the treatment of a sprain. It's just ice elevation NSAIDs. Um, for ankle sprains, if you get a question, very likely it will be about the anterior talofibular ligament. So if you only remember one thing about ankle sprains, remember the ATF ligament always tears first. Let's talk about Achilles tendon rupture next. Really just two things that I would know for this. Risk factors, fluoroquinolones. So fluoroquinolones can put patients at an increased risk for tendon rupture. Is it common? No. In a large case control study, only about 12 patients in 100,000 actually had this. But just because something isn't common in real life, it doesn't mean it's not a common exam question. And this one's a favorite for exam questions. So know it. 
Um, another common cause is going to be a uh, sports related injury. Actually over 80% of ruptures occurred during recreational sports, uh, particularly stop and go sports such as tennis, basketball, softball, but for the exam, really focus on them giving you some history of fluoroquinolones. That's what they like to ask for whatever reason. Um, no need to focus on the clinical manifestations. They're pretty common sense. Basically, they're going to describe a pop and some uh, sudden severe pain in the posterior ankle. What you do need to know is the Thompson test. So definitely be familiar with this. And to do the test, the patient lies prone and um, you're going to have their feet dangling off the table. You squeeze the calf, which is the gastrocnemius muscle, and then you watch for plantar flexion of the foot. The absence of plantar flexion will mark a positive test, which is indicative of a rupture. This is an important test because other indicators of Achilles tendon rupture aren't always accurate. For instance, you can ask somebody to plantar flex their foot, and it's not always an accurate way to assist in diagnosis because you can actually plantar flex your foot using accessory muscles like the tibialis posterior. So always perform the Thompson test in a suspected Achilles tendon rupture. Squeeze that calf. So the diagnosis of rupture can be made solely on the clinical exam, but you can get an MRI or even an ultrasound actually to confirm. And the treatment can range from splinting all the way to surgical repair. Not important. Two things you need to know for Achilles tendon rupture, fluoroquinolones, and know the Thompson test. Let's talk about plantar fasciitis. Not very high yield here, but it does come up occasionally. So just know that this is a chronic overuse that leads to micro tears and inflammation in the origin of the plantar fascia. Um, and it's going to lead to heel pain that is worse with their first few steps in the morning or after a period of inactivity. That's what you're looking for in the vignette. They're going to describe some kind of heel pain when they first wake up in the morning. That's normally how it's going to be presented. Um, and then you can just take a look at where the um, plantar fascia is there. This is mainly a clinical diagnosis. X-rays would really just to be a rule out rule out some differentials like a calcaneal stress fracture, for instance, but nothing really to know for imaging or lab tests. And then treatment is pretty low yield. It's just conservative. Um, stretching exercises for the plantar fascia, the calf muscle, um, silicone heel shoe inserts, NSAIDs. You can do corticosteroid injections. Not really very much to know there. Let's talk about interdigital or Morton's neuroma. So this is a compressive neuropathy of the interdigital nerve that leads to plantar forefoot pain. So basically, there's something squeezing the foot, causing the metatarsals to squeeze together and put pressure on the nerve between the two structures, which leads to a proliferation and benign growth of the nerve tissue. And this can lead to numbness, burning, et cetera, in the foot. Who you're looking for is going to be women and um, women wearing tight fitting shoes, high heels. So the vignette, they're absolutely going to be female. This is five times more likely in females than males um, to develop a more neuroma. Um, and they may mention something about the shoes. So wearing shoes that are either too tight or wearing high heels as both over pronation, like when you're wearing high heels, so you're like over pronating the foot is a risk factor. And then wearing tight shoes are also both associated with the condition. You're going to look for a burning pain, most common in the third intermetatarsal space. So a patient with a neuroma will most commonly complain of this burning pain in the third intermetatarsal space. So that's what they're going to give you um, in between the third and the fourth distal metatarsals. This is a clinical diagnosis for the most part. Can use ultrasound to actually visualize the neuroma. Usually it's not necessary. There's nothing you need to really know for treatment either. It's mainly conservative metatarsal support, padded shoe insert, specialized orthotic shoes and not wearing the shoes that were causing the problem um, in the first place. So the way that I used to remember Morton's neuroma, the couple things that you needed to know here, actually this is just to take a quick look at what it is here. So you can remember the third metatarsal space. You see this proliferation of the nerve that's causing this kind of pressure here and causing all the burning and pain there. Um, so the way that I remember the couple things you need to remember it, um, so as soon as I'd see Morton's neuroma, I would think of this M and then I think of first turning the M to the side. And when you turn an M to the side, it looks like a three. That helped me remember the third intermetatarsal space is the most common place for the burning um, pain that they're going to have. And then I used to remember turning that M upside down and that helped me remember women are most common. So turn the M to the side, third intermetatarsal space, most common pain for the burning. Turn the M upside down. That's a W that helped me remember women is most common. I also used to think that this, when you turn the M upside down, it kind of looks like two heels, which helped me remember that high heels can sometimes be in the vignette as the cause of the, the Morton's neuroma in the first place. But I don't know if that works for you or not. So Morton's neuroma, remember, turn it to the side, third inner metatarsal space, upside down, W, because it's most common in women. Okay, let's move on to Jones fracture. Very little to know here. Um, Jones fracture is a fracture 
of the fifth metatarsal, the proximal diaphysis, at the junction of the metaphysis and the diaphysis. You can remember a Jones fracture is a fracture of the fifth metatarsal because Jones has five letters. And then pseudo Jones, um, you may hear of this being called the pseudo Jones fractures. This terminology isn't being used as much as it used to be. Um, but if you do, it's the same thing. It's a fracture of the fifth metatarsal, but it's just a bit more proximal. It's a fracture of the base or the tuberosity of the fifth metatarsal. The way that I used to remember this, it's not really much to know here. This is all I used to remember. Jones fracture is a uh, fracture of the fifth metatarsal. I used to remember Jones has five letters, fifth metatarsal right here. And then pseudo Jones, pseudo Jones is also a fracture of the fifth metatarsal, but the P in pseudo Jones helps me remember that it's more proximal. So the P stands for proximal Jones, five letters, fifth metatarsal, because you can see it's at the, um, the base here, the tuberosity. So more proximal than a Jones fracture, which is higher up at the um, metaphysis and the diaphysis, the junction there. So remember Jones fracture, five letters, fracture of the fifth metatarsal, pseudo Jones, more proximal of the fifth down here at the base at the tuberosity. All right, let's move on to the last thing I think you should be familiar with for the lower extremity, and that is a Liz Frank, also known as a tarsal metatarsal injury. It's an injury, this one's a little bit more complicated, but I'll go over it. So it's an injury in which the metatarsal bones are displaced from the tarsus. So the Liz Frank ligament consists of three ligaments that run from the second metatarsal to the medial cuneiform. So, and you can see where the Liz Frank ligament is here. Um, so when you have a tarsal metatarsal fracture or other trauma to this area, it can lead to a disruption between the medial cuneiform and the base of the second metatarsal, which can lead to widening between the first and the second metatarsal bases because, because the second metatarsal, when it fractures, it loses its anchor, which holds it in place, the Liz Frank um, ligament. So you can imagine if you have a fracture here or you have a fracture here, it loses its base. And now this ligament's no longer going to hold these two. And then you're going to see a widening between here. And a lot of times this is missed because a lot of times you don't see a fracture and all you see is a widening and it's easily missed. And there's actually a lot of complications that can go by missing this. So you want to be familiar with this. This can also occur in any of the metatarsal ligaments. So it can happen all the way down here. But this is what we're talking about right here, this widening between between the, um, the first and the second there. So something known as the flex sign is pathognomonic for Liz Frank injury. So a flex sign is when there's an avulsion uh, fracture at the origin or the insertion point of the Liz Frank ligament. So either at the medial cuneiform or the base of the second metatarsal where the Liz Frank ligament transverses. Um, oftentimes you'll see a bony fragment. We can take a look here in the first metatarsal space. So this finding is pathognomonic for a Liz Frank injury because you know the anchor of the Liz Frank ligament has been fractured off either at the origin or the assertion point of the ligament. You can see that little bony fragment here in between this, um, in between the space here. So this fracture either at the second or the medial cuneiform can lead to this little fragment here because the tendon pulled it um, and that can cause this, um, this finding, this flex sign. Um, all right, so not too much else to know here. The treatment, what well, you need to know that um, surgical intervention, so this can be treated conservatively with a cast immobilization, but the problem is even relatively minor injuries to the tarsal metatarsal joint can lead to severe disability. So whereas some other injuries, sometimes the treatment can just be supportive. In the case of a Liz Frank injury, more often than not, the treatment is gonna be surgical repair because if it's not treated properly, or if the diagnosis is missed, it can lead to osteoarthritis and long-term disability and other issues. So Liz Frank injury, it's a little bit complicated but just be familiar with some of the things that you may see here so that's really all i think that you should really focus on for your lower extremities so five quick questions and then we will wrap this up so question one 27 year old male presents to the office with pain and swelling of his left knee he was playing soccer with friends and he was and he was running when he stopped short to change directions and felt a pop in his left knee followed by pain and swelling Lockman test is performed, which demonstrates increased anterior translocation or translation of the tibia compared to the uninjured leg with no distinct endpoint. What type of injury did this patient likely sustain? So that is going to be an injury to the anterior cruciate ligament. So first the history, a pop in the knee followed by immediate swelling. Remember that hemarthrosis is a very common presentation for an ACL tear. Up to 77% of patients with acute hemarthrosis after injury of the knee have an ACL tear. And then you have your positive Lachman test, which really wrapped this up for us. We know this is the most sensitive test for an ACL tear. And we remember that because the first three letters of Lachman are ACL rearranged. So all signs point to an ACL tear in this patient. 
Question two, a 14-year-old boy presents to the office complaining of anterior knee pain. He states the pain is most severe when he plays basketball or squats down. On exam, you note a pronounced tender tibial tubercle. What is the mainstay of treatment for the likely diagnosis in this patient? So that is going to be conservative. And says ice rest elevation. So this is osgood schlatter disease. We have a 14-year-old boy. Fits the demographics already as osgood schlatter is most common in males in the 9 to 14-year-old age range. Peak incidence in boys, as we talked about before, is 13 to 14 years when they're going through a growth spurt. Pain exacerbated when squatting, jumping, etc. When he's playing sports, all very typical. And then an exam, the pronounced tibial, uh, tender tibial tubercle, which seals the deal. As we know, this is an injury caused by rep repetitive strain and chronic avulsion of the apophysis of the tibial tubercle. Mainstay of treatment for osgood schlatter disease is a conservative. Um, and you can remember, again, instead of osgood schlatter disease, remember osgood squatter knees. Helps you remember it's exacerbated by activities like squatting. And Denise helps you remember this is an issue with the knees. Question three, what is the most common ligament to injure in an ankle sprain? So that is going to be your anterior talofibular, also known as your ATF ligament. Remember, your ATF ligament, the ATF ligament in your mind is always going to stand for always tears first because this is the ligament in the ankle most likely to tear in an ankle sprain. Question four, which test is performed as part of the physical exam in a suspected Achilles tendon rupture that involves squeezing the gastrocnemius muscle and watching for plantar flexion of the foot? That is going to be a Thompson test. You squeeze the calf, looks, look to see if the, the foot plantar flexes. If not, this is a positive test indicating likely an Achilles tendon rupture. Question five, a 31-year-old male was playing football with his friends when one of his friends landed on the lateral aspect of his right knee in an attempt to tackle him. He immediately felt a tearing sensation, which was followed by severe pain. A valgus stress test is performed, which displays pain and laxity at approximately 30 degrees of flexion. What structure of the knee did this patient likely injure? So that is going to be your, um, I put medical, but this is your uh, medial collateral ligament. Um, so we have a patient with lateral trauma to the knee and a positive valgus stress test. MCL injury would be the most common structure to be injured in the setting of this type of trauma and confirmed with a positive valgus stress test. Again, if you forget which test is positive with which ligament, remember MCL is tested with the valgus stress test. Valgus, think of mucho gusto. The mucho starts with an M, so that helps you remember MCL. Gusto for valgus. And remember, mucho gusto means nice to meet you. That's because valgus forces from the knees being pushed inward, meeting at the middle. All right, so that was the MSK section for the lower extremity. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you so much for the support. And good luck in PA school, your pants, your panneries, and your EOR.